Thank you. Um, I will also start acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land uh, we're meeting today, so the Kabatabi people, so I do acknowledge their elders past, present and emergent. Um, so this is my first citizen science conference here in Australia, so I don't know most of you. Um, I did see a few faces on Monday who came to the uh, Melbourne workshop. So for those people who were there, sorry, you're going to hear the sometimes twice, but uh, for the others, hopefully I'm going to be able to give you a bit of an overview of our citizen science project that we're running here on the Central Red Coast. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the, the Forest Research Institute, which is um, housed here at the university. So we do a lot of forest research. And uh, part of that is, of course, uh, bushfire research. And it's very topical here in Australia, of course. Um, so NOBURN is, is a false acronym, uh, stands for National Bushfire Resilience Network. Um, it is a citizen science project that we pulled together after the 2019-2020 uh, Black Summer bushfire season. Um, we identify ourselves as a very multidisciplinary citizen science project. Uh, we cover disciplines of forest research, fire research, human factor social technical systems, um, social science, computer science, um, communication, marketing. Um, so there's quite a few researchers actually involved. Um, unfortunately, I'm the only one here today. Um, we are funded by the Commonwealth Department of um, Industry, Science and Resources, and we are also a collaboration between the university here, the NUSA Shared Council, and the University of Adelaide, in particular their um, Institute for Machine Learning. So that's another element that we wanted to bring into this project. And um, so the project is um, projected to end in April 2025. So the aim of Noburn and, and what we sort of come, came up with after the 2019-2020 uh, bushfire season and getting people more involved into bushfire research is that we wanted to stimulate people or community, um, getting them involved into, into data collection and mapping of forest fuels. One of the, the more difficult things for us as, as fire researchers, uh, particularly with predictive modeling of bushfires, is being able to um, understand what is happening under a uh, forest canopy. Um, it's a vast area, uh, can go up to 30, 40, 50 meters, um, that can have different structures. And that structure is really hard to capture from um, sort of a professional or, or you know, um, from that angle, I guess. Um, so what we wanted to enable is we wanted to give people an opportunity to, to collect data and tell us a little bit more about that forest structure um, through citizen science. That information is really important for us from a predictive perspective, um, especially around the severity, intensity, and burn area of bushfire. So that's something that we want to do or enable with the data that is collected through the project. Uh, but of course, as every or most citizen science project, there is an important literacy element as well, um, giving that understanding about what the meaning is behind forest fuels in forest. What what does that mean? What how does it impact fires or the environment that we live in? And so creating that awareness potentially around the risks that are associated with, um, with forest fuels and, and their potential to burn. So there's two um, main ways that we uh, try to engage with our community. We are only sort of in the initial steps of our community engagement. Uh, so that is the Noburn app. There's a couple of banners out here as well. Um, so this is a, an app that we developed um, as a citizen science tool. Um, so if you haven't already, or if you're interested in the project, uh, feel free to download it. So you can just go to your app store and look for No Burn, or you can just scan the QR code that will take you to social media pages and all of those things. So um, you can learn more about the project just in general. Uh, we also have a website, so you can just go to noburn.app, learn more about the project, the team, and um, everything sort of involved in it um, as well. So the, the Noburn app, like I said, is our main sort of tool of communicating and engaging with our citizen scientists. Um, so we, we have developed an app completely in-house with the university here and all the people involved um, as a simple way to um, enable people to participate into research and collect data um, for the project. So there's a few simple screens here where you can learn about the different fuel layers or layers within the forest and how you can identify the risk of those layers relative to uh, the bushfire perspective. Um, you can do a recording of um, uh, overall fuel hazard, and those who are here on Monday in the workshop have, have done some in the field. 
Um, essentially, it's a process where we ask you to take some photos, tell us a bit about the forest location, and then go through, in a guided sort of process, we take you through the different forest fuel layers, and then you assess their risk rating from something that's low risk to something that's an extreme risk. And then, of course, you have a profile uh, page where you can uh, edit your profile and learn more about the project as well. Now, the protocol or, or the process that we have enabled in that app um, to record overall fuel hazard is essentially a, um, I don't want to use the word dummy, but a simplified version of this type of document. So this is actually an industry practice um, that's used by uh, fire and emergency crews, councils, um, land care, or lots of fire practitioners, forestry companies. Um, that's used within Australian forest to assess fuel. Um, so it's a standardized process developed by fire researchers. Um, and it's essentially a visual assessment of um, the different risks that are associated with fuels within any particular forest location. So what this, mean, what this means from an impact perspective as well is that we are essentially duplicating this exact same protocol in, a, um, in an app version. So that means that this information is exactly the same in format and type as what is already collected by uh, professional stakeholders, essentially, and the industry. So this type of information, we've already had requests from um, things like Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. It's like, look, if, if you have people out in the field collecting your information, can we then access this information directly into our systems? Because we are doing this as well, but they would have to pay people to go out and collect this type of information um, and you know this is something that's quite complicated um, and, and costly for them so um, but a very important information because this this essentially determines their fuel management strategy so this type of information around how what the hazard rating is of a particular fuel in the forest will determine what sort of actions they will take to mitigate that risk, reduce the fuels, and then also mitigate the risk of any potential bushfire. So there is a direct impact there with your stakeholders as well as within your community, as we might be saving lives, just mitigating bushfires just more generally. Um, now, following this protocol, and like I was saying, this is still a visual assessment. Um, there is a bit of a people's bias here because what you see in a forest might be different than what I see in a forest and that's something that's really sort of hard to, to put on paper or to quantify. So one of the things that we really like to do or, or we're trying to do at least with the um, Citizen Science Project is to enable machine learning to do detection and segmentation of those images. So you will take a photo like the bottom uh, right one for you. Um, what we want artificial intelligence to be able to do is to say, well, look, there's trees. Those trees have a stringy bark, bark type. That bark, uh, that bark type has an extreme, let's say, fuel hazard rating. And go through all of the different layers of fuels that, that are staken within that image. Um, when we train our artificial intelligence to, to do this in a validated way, we'll actually, um, the artificial intelligence will get better and better. So that when we give it a new photo, a photo that you might have taken on the weekend or tomorrow, um, it will automatically be able to detect, like, look, this is a forest, this is you know, the hazard rating of that particular location, and that, like I said, is the exact same information that is collected by fire and emergency crews um, on a daily basis. So and that information can actually then stimulate fire management or mitigation strategies. So that's one way of the things that we wanted to do with, um, one of the things we wanted to do with machine learning. Uh, the other one is, um, we've already been able to deliver a proof of concept of this, but this is uh, particularly the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, for bushfire prediction. This is still currently a process that happens um, using mostly physics-based models, so less like, uh, less so using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But we can do the same thing. We can train uh, models to learn from historic fires. What were the conditions leading up to a fire? What was the weather like? What was the topography, the vegetation, um, the previous history of that particular area like before the fire happened? We can say the fire happened. This is the area it consumed. This is how intense it burned. This is how high the flames were. All of these things that we know. Artificial intelligence can, can, can learn from that experience. And the more of that we give it, the smarter it will become. And then 
what we then eventually want to do is through our citizen science project is like look here is a new area we have these photos this is the fuel hazard rating uh, at the time this record was taken the weather was so 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 and so um, we know the exact location of where the photo was taken so then in the case a fire were to start what area would it consume how likely would that fire happen all of those things so that's kind of that sort of more advanced machine learning um, methodology that we'd like to uh, put into practice so we've done some um, examples here so this is primarily focused on the 2019-2020 fire season and these are some images from New South Wales so uh, this is a probability map so artificial intelligence of the models that we use uh, we're able to sort of give a likelihood like if that particular area pre-fire was to ignite at any particular location then the map here shows you what areas would be most likely impacted by that fire so the lighter the color the most likely and then we can sort of compare that with an, an actual post fire image similar thing here for uh, a burn area so if you want to think the area that a fire would consume so we can do the exact same thing so we give it an area pre-fire we know a fire happened in there but we tell artificial intelligence look nothing has happened here if a fire were to start in this place what area will it consume so we predict the red dotted uh, area there and then we know that a fire happened so when we look back at the next satellite image post fire we then see like oh well the white is actually the, the actual ground truth or the footprint of that fire so this had about 86 percent accuracy and didn't really take us that long to predict and this is still using fairly um, um, like this is satellite imagery, um, weather data, topography, previous fire history. So it doesn't include that nitty gritty detail that we're trying to collect through the No Burn project, particularly on different fuel layers. So we're hoping to improve that type of modeling. Um, and we can also do temporal um, sort of type models where we actually look at how a fire were to progress in the landscape under different scenarios. We can see here, particularly in that sort of um, dashed red line that the model is able to take up barriers in the landscape. Um, so in this case, um, there's a river in, the, in, in this particular national park. So it's able to pick that up and say like, look, if there's a river, there's less likelihood that your fire will jump that barrier. Um, so yeah, that's some of the bigger thinking and, and project goals that we're, we're trying to deliver through um, the Citizen Science Project. Um, so what we want people to do, we, we have launched our app in August, so it's fairly recent. Um, we're tracking well with our, our users and our records, but um, there's a bit of a different way of, of citizen science for us. Um, when we started off with the project and we looked at what else was around in the citizen science world, particularly around the 2019-2020 bushfires, we saw that most of the project were actually targeted at post-fire, um, things like recovery and, and, and what's coming back after a fire. Whereas we then wanted to think like, well, why wait until fire happens before we can enable citizen science? If people can get involved in citizen science and actually before a fire, then we might be able to do something about the, the potential negative impact of fire. So what we want people to do is essentially to snap a pic and help us predict bushfires. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. It's very innovative indeed. Uh, any Thank you. Um, just a couple of uh, variables that would obviously be important, and that was this moisture content of vegetation and the soil, and also the litter layer. Are you planning to be able to incorporate those into the app somehow? Or the, sorry, the machine intelligence. Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, not directly in the app. So um, we wanted to make the protocol of um, collecting information as simple as possible. So um, when you're getting used to it, like I think maybe five minutes of your time to actually go through an overall fuel hazard assessment. Uh, one of the things that we want to do with our artificial intelligence and essentially we would have to do a whole lot of um, data collection on the side of the validated method, including your moisture, uh, moisture content um, sort of data to be able to identify like look this is dry is it wet uh, but we want to be able to um, with artificial intelligence to differentiate between dry versus wet forest um, so is it brown looking versus is it green looking kind of thing um, it might not be as so it sounds very simple but it's not necessarily like that um, 
the problem we will face or we are facing with that um, is just the quality of images that are submitted. Every camera is different. Um, so there's a lot more variables to that that are specific to the user's phone. Um, whether they clean their lens, the time of the day, the sun, the clouds, all have an impact on the color that you see once the photo comes to us. So those are a lot of things that we don't really have control over um, and will impact the influence of AI to be able to pick up that this is dry versus wet. But that's sort of that you know, worst I think view. So what you're trying to do is just improve that 86% to a little bit higher with the ground truthing, is that right? For the modeling, uh, yes, for sure, yeah. I'm quite confident that we can, yeah. Um, so the main um, use of your app is the prediction for safety of humans. Is there any kind of um, adaptability for it for um, conservation practices where animals require leaf litter and so that you wouldn't burn in an area? You know, because you, you want to try and predict in the fire what's happened there and therefore maybe pre-burn to minimise the impact for humans. Yeah. But there's a lot of wildlife that mm. need leaf litter or depend on leaf litter. Yeah, this certainly not um, a tool that um, promotes that decision-making of what is happening with the fuels. So essentially it's just a, a tool that will enable us to say, well, here is a location, there is an extreme fuel load. That's where it sort of ends from that perspective. Um, whoever the landowner is of that particular location will make the decision on what they will do with that fuel load and that might include not doing anything. Yeah, And that will in most cases be, be that answer. <laughs> um, in locations, so what we sort of working with, um, with fire and emergencies, for example, is um, if you're going into um, a particular sort of recreational area and we have 20 citizen scientists or community members just um, taking photos and reporting fuel hazard in a particular location and all of them are coming back with an extreme area and we're 200 meters away from a housing or a development, then that is a trigger for them to, well, maybe we should go have a look, maybe we can do our own assessment and pinpoint those areas that might require attention. So that's kind of like the limit for us um, when it comes to the modeling, um, that doesn't really involve any of that sort of management or all the different types of management that could take place because, yeah, that's yeah, maybe in the future, but not, not at this stage. Sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, just reflecting on the slide where you're talking about the Victorian government and their use in the methodology. I guess some concerns that we hear, um, one from government is uh, for citizen scientists obviously not to take any jobs um, away from, from paid people, and, and secondly, for citizen science not to be a reason for governments not to invest in monitoring that they would otherwise do. So I just wondering if you have any thoughts on those two sort of principles, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is actually an interesting question first time I sort of hear it from that uh, perspective because I've had those exact same conversations but more sort of like well we want citizen scientists to go and do it it doesn't replace it because like I said we're still doing a visual assessment that is there's a big people's minds there so you know we have different levels of people with different levels of skill that will contribute to this data set but none of that is validated so there is a huge validation element there that would still be in the hands of um, the responsible landowner. So whether that's a council, state government, um, forestry company, whatever it is, would still have a huge role in, in being able to validate that. Um, and that's probably all I, <laughs> all I can say to that. Um, the standards are there to be, like, we, we did talk to the Victorian government and it's, it's their document, um, but it's a standard that's used quite widely by lots of people. Um, so, yeah, that's probably all I can do. <laughs> okay, look, thank you. Can we thank Sam again for his talk? Thank you.